uh, to the Minister of Education. And we will start with the listed questions. I call Mr. Thomas Buchanan. Mr. Buchanan. Question number one, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. The, the Department has written to a number of primary schools following reports that schools may have been involving, involved in coaching pupils for the unregulated test during core teaching time. It is not accurate to describe the letters as warning letters, as their purpose was to provide the school principal with an opportunity to comment and to confirm that the Boards of Governors had complied with their legal duty to have regard to the Department's guidance on post-primary transfer. The guidance states that primary schools should not facilitate unregulated entrance test arrangements in any way, and this includes carrying out preparation for unregulated tests during core teaching times. In writing to the 11 schools, the Department has also, was also enabling principals to provide confirmation that their school was meeting its statutory obligation to deliver the curriculum to all pupils. The fact that a school is written to you in these terms does not indicate that the school has been engaging in preparing children for unregulated tests or indeed that the school is failing to deliver the statutory curriculum. It merely indicates that a concern has been raised about a possible coaching at the school. The Department's overriding priority is ensuring that educational needs of pupils are being met. The Department cannot stand by and fail to act when concerns are raised that coaching for unregulated tests may be affecting the delivery of the curriculum and therefore the educational development of all children. Thomas Buchanan for a supplementary. Yeah. Thank the Minister for his response. But would the Minister confirm that the Board of Governors has supremacy on this matter? And as Minister, does he recognise their independence? Um, the Board of Governors does not have supremacy in this matter. The uh, Board of Governors is there to ensure that the curriculum, the statutory curriculum is being delivered and that they do have to have regard to the guidance issued by the Department of Education released on regulated tests, but they most certainly have a statutory duty to ensure that the curriculum is being delivered to all children. Now, the concerns that have been raised with me and my department vary uh, in, in degrees of seriousness. However, is the member seriously suggesting that my department should ignore the fact that a parent or someone else in the public raises concerns that all children in our school are not receiving access to the full curriculum or that their educational learning is being uh, fathered by the fact that some pupils are receiving preferential treatment over others. I think I would be failing in my duty if I did not raise those concerns. Donnie Kennehan. Uh, Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, does the Minister agree with his party colleague, Mr Hazard? who has accused the primary schools of coaching as misappropriating public funds? Or does he agree with me that those are outrageous remarks which should be withdrawn immediately? It depends at the level of which coaching is taking place and how much time schools are directing public funds which are given to the school for the teaching of all pupils, not just some of the pupils. Uh, so it depends on the varying degrees of which that takes place. But the member is vice chair of the Education Committee. The Education Committee's role is to hold my department to account and me as minister as a, to account. If I failed in my duties to write out to a school that has been accused of or concerns raised over coaching of a test or not living up to its statutory obligation, now its statutory, its legal obligation to teach the curriculum, then I think the committee would be justified in challenging me as minister for not carrying out my duties. But here I have a vice chair of a committee criticising me as Minister for ensuring that the statutory curriculum of, of our, uh, our education system is being delivered. It seems to me somewhat ridiculous. Call Mr Sean Rogers. Minister, what evidence have you to suggest that some schools are failing in their duty to d deliver the key stage two curriculum? Um, as I said in my response, uh, we write out to schools and ask them to confirm their position in regard to this matter and schools will respond in due course. We receive letters of complaint or complaints from parents and other members of the public. Therefore, we follow them up, as is my duty as a minister to ensure that the legal obligations of my department are being carried out. Judith Cochran. Deputy Speaker, uh, would the Minister agree um, that some preparation should be given to primary school children in how to deal with exams? Because for many, um, within three months of them uh, starting secondary education, they're expected actually to sit a range of exams in uh, numerous different subjects. And if primary schools don't do some of that prep, who will? Well, the member, uh, I'm surprised, isn't aware that 
throughout the life of a primary school pupil, they will be sitting various tests. Well, I assure you they do. Uh, they may sit weekly tests in terms so the teacher can assess how they are progressing in the curriculum. They may, or may sit, or sit monthly tests to, to see how they are progressing in the curriculum. But these tests, they are not there for the benefit of the primary school. They are not there for the benefit of all the children in the classroom. They are for the benefit of a selected number of schools who select and reject 10 11 year old children. They have nothing whatsoever to do with the primary curriculum for which our schools are tasked and given public money to deliver. And people need to get their priorities right. My job as Education Minister is to ensure that all young people have an opportunity in life, not just some. And in the worst case examples that have been given to me over the years is this, where some children are coached for a test and other children are standing in the back of the classroom with colouring pencils. Now, is that the education system members in this House want to see delivered in our classrooms? It's not the education system I am prepared to see delivered in our classrooms. I expect all schools to teach all children to ensure that all children have an opportunity in life. I call Mr Chris Hazard. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Can I ask the Minister for his view on the educational disadvantage in those instances where children are sent to the back of the classroom with colour and pencils while other children are coached for an exam at the front? Well, any corruption to the curriculum is bad for education. Our, our, our primary school curriculum is broad based and we allow our, our, our teachers and our, and our schools to choose the tools and the equipment and, and the, the material they need to deliver that curriculum to all the children in the school. And primary schools have a, a role in education. Their, their role in education is not simply to prepare young people and children for post-primary education. Their role is to prepare children for primary school education. That is their role. We have a specific primary school curriculum to ensure that young people develop and, uh, uh, and to, be, to be enriched in their educational outcomes. Some people in this chamber, some people in this chamber seem to have the view that primary schools are there to corral children for a, a number of years and then select out the few, select out the few and send them off to voluntary grammars and, and grammar schools. And they're the chosen ones where the rest of them can do whatever they want. That seems to be the mood of some people in the chamber. So it, is some, that appears to be the mood of some people in the chamber. Whereas I believe it's fair and equitable, and only just, that taxpayers' money given to schools is used to ensure that all the young children in the school receive an education, not just the chosen few. Berlin. Principal Deputy Speaker, question number two, please. The total number of teacher training places allocated to St Mary's University College in 1213 was at 165 and to Strand Millis University College it was 160. The allocations have remained unchanged in respect of the 1314 and 1415 years. I am currently considering the allocations for 1516 academic year. For supplementary. Yes, I thank the minister for his answer. Um, could I ask him, given, given that the, on the last available figures only 18% of teachers actually found a job from one year's graduation, and that the signature programme is about to finish, and that the te teachers' pension scheme is now being extended to make teachers work much longer, how in the world can he justify educating or uh, p putting through teacher training places for probably more than 50% more than the number of teachers we actually need? How the numbers are chosen goes through a number of assessments, but the member appears to be supporting his colleague's assertion that we should close our, our local teacher training colleges, um, because we are at a very critical stage in terms of our teacher training colleges, and if I was to reduce the numbers significantly more, or even slightly more, or, slight, or slightly less teacher training places, then we would lose our teacher training colleges. Now, it's for others to make that decision, but personally, I believe that would be a huge mistake. I believe it would be a huge mistake to lose that uh, economic driver, which is in our communities. And also, the, this is one of the most important statistics out of teacher training. For every one place there is in teacher training college, there's eight applicants. 
eight applicants. So it's still a very, very popular career choice for our young people. Now, those young people have to make the decision. If I take on teacher, uh, teacher training and I, I qualify as a teacher, will I have an opportunity to fulfil my career pathway and become a full-time teacher? That, there's a serious question mark over that for many of them. But what we can do instead is we can close our teacher training colleges down and send all those young people over to England. I personally think that would be a huge mistake. Mr Nelson McCausland. In view of the number of uh, places that there are uh, to which trained teachers can apply, and in view of the number who are uh, being trained, could the Minister tell us, would he support the removal of the requirement that to teach in Roman Catholic maintained schools requires a special certificate, which is viewed by many people as a discriminatory practice? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that is a matter for the First and Deputy First Minister uh, to take on board. I have actually written to the First and Deputy First Minister. I have written to the Deputy First, Minister, First and Deputy First Minister on several occasions, and I am waiting a response on that. Personally, I believe it should be removed. However, it is up to the First and Deputy First Minister to carry that matter forward. Mr. Pat Sheehan. Could the Minister tell us what impact any further reductions in the initial teacher uh, training intake numbers might have on, on students who see teaching as a vocation? and won't be deterred by limited places in local universities? Well, as I said in, in response to Mr Long, I believe that we are now at a situation where if I was to reduce teacher training places uh, even slightly, we would see the closure of our teacher training colleges. And that, to me, damages our education system, it damages our economy, and all we are doing is shipping more young people uh, over to England or, or Wales, wherever they may wish to do their, their teacher training, and then they will return here uh, anyhow. So let, 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 let's, let us produce the high quality teacher uh, trainee teachers. Let us ensure that it happens here. Let our teaching institutions become the envy uh, around these islands instead of closing them down and sending our, our young trainee teachers elsewhere. Mr. Robin Swan. Deputy Speaker. Minister, are you aware at last week's Employment and Learning Committee that the Minister for Employment and Learning accused you, of, you and your predecessor of being involved in a racket and being involved in a model that artificially topped up the number of places of teacher training? Can I ask you, has the Minister of Employment and Learning ever asked you to reduce the number of teacher places? Well, I, I'm not aware of what exactly was or was not said at last week's Dale Committee. Uh, we have regular or we will have discussions in regards to teacher training numbers in the time ahead with the Dale Minister. We have reduced teacher training places over this last number of years by 30 per cent. The Dale Minister has asked for those numbers to be reduced. I believe the numbers we bring forward are reasonable uh, and think beyond the current economic climate. They think into the future and, and we're in, about ensuring that we have a good cohort of freshly trained teachers coming through the system. And I, I think the decisions we have made thus far are justified. And I do emphasise again, we have reduced teacher training numbers by 30 per cent over this last number of years. Mr Alex Atwood. Given that you said, Minister, that it would be a huge mistake to close our teacher training colleges, and given that we are in a critical stage in respect of Stranmillis and St Mary's, and given that there may be as little as 40 days and nights between now and Perda, in the middle of March. Can you indicate whether you believe this issue, given last week's vote of the Premier uh, for St Mary's and for Stranmillis, will be resolved? Because if it is not resolved by the 20th of March, then the uh, finances of those two colleges will be in jeopardy. Well, I am not sure Perda um, rules over executive ministers. Uh, I know it, it does relate in terms of the Westminster election, etc. Uh, but I, I think it can be resolved very quickly, and I understand also that the First and Deputy First Minister um, are seeking this matter to be brought to the Executive, uh, and it may well be resolved there. I would like to see it be resolved before that, but it's a matter uh, for the Dale Minister, unless the, the, the First and Deputy First Minister call it into the Executive again, and then it's a matter for the Executive. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Uh, the Stormont House Agreement included a reference to additional capital funding for education as follows. 
a contribution of up to 500 million over 10 years of new capital funding support, shared and integrated education subject, individual projects being agreed between the executive and the government. Uh, the Department of Education officials are currently engaging with the Treasury and the NIO to agree to shared campuses and integrated school building projects that this funding is deemed applicable for. When agreement uh, has been reached, the Department will bring forward the potential school build projects that qualify for the funding. Uh, the Department will submit these projects to the Executive and to the Treasury uh, in accordance with the Stormont House Agreement. It is not anticipated that this potential funding for shared and integrated education will have any impact on my departmental functions. Mr. Officer, first supplementary. Thank you. So, if each program has to, each project has to be agreed, does the minister anticipate the business plans for each having to be agreed by Her Majesty's Treasury as well as his department? And does he look forward to that unique form of power sharing with Her Majesty's government? Um, certainly, it might diminish him as a minister. I wouldn't object to that, but he might. Well, well the fact of the matter is that you have objected to the Stormont House Agreement and the £500 million investment in our education system that went with it. So you wouldn't find yourself in this position because you would have said in your traditional format, no. <laughs> so, uh, therefore, uh, you wouldn't have to query any of those questions because, see, no is a very easy word. But where if you want to invest in education and you want to build a better society and you want to create a new society uh, different from the one you and I grew up in, then sometimes you have to say yes. And when you say yes, you have to work your way through those processes. In terms of business cases, etc., I would hope that the Treasury, uh, like I, wishes to avoid uh, duplication of bureaucracy rather than uh, increasing that uh, bureaucracy. So I would like to hope, and the discussions are ongoing, that we make this process as simple as possible, as effective as possible, and that we deliver new bills uh, in our communities, and that we strengthen shared and integrated education within our society. Call Mr. Sammy Wilson. As well as accepting advice from Her Majesty's Treasury on his capital spend for integrated education, will the Minister also give assurances that any capital spend which impacts upon other schools within a locality, yes. that there will be consideration given to the views of other education providers, and that we will not have a situation where, for example, an integrated school is allowed to expand at the expense of schools which are already, already exist in the area, and may we well be op operating under capacity anyway. Yeah. Um, well, I will accept or take advice from all quarters and then make decisions. Uh, that's the role often. But any, any, any project being brought forward will have to be area plan proof, so therefore we will have to take into account uh, its impact, both positive or negative, in regards to other schools uh, in its locality. Call Mr John Dallet. Mr. Speaker, I don't want to get caught up in any controversy uh, involving uh, Mrs Windsor, uh, but uh, could the Minister tell us if this money is about shared education projects rather than about shared education, which already exists in many schools, and those schools may not benefit from this bounty, whoever it comes from? Um, well, it's capital, so therefore it's infrastructure. Uh, it's development in terms of uh, physical developments. And I wouldn't ruin anyone in or out right at this stage. We're still working our way through the finer detail of it. And I, ex well, I accept, I think what the member is trying to suggest is that in many instances schools have led the agenda in regard to shared education, and many have been years ahead of, of politicians in regard to shared education, and I, and I fully accept that. And there's significant good work goes on behind the scenes and quietly behind the scenes in relation to shared education. Uh, and as I say, I'm not ruling anyone in or out of benefiting from this. Money, but it's not, it's not revenue led, it's not project led, it is infrastructure led. Uh, I thank the Deputy uh, Speaker and also thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Could I ask the Minister what a shared campus and integrated projects is currently being taken forward in planning for Emil Muggett? Uh, go on, Boykus. Uh, 
Uh, there are currently six primary schools and one post-primary integrated project being taken forward in planning. These are in terms of primary, Braidside, Portadown integrated primary school, Drumlands, Row Valley, Oma and Curran, and in the post-primary sector, Park Hall integrated college is being brought forward in planning. I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question four. As part of the 15-16 final budget outcome, my department received an additional $64.9 million in funding in recognition of the inescapable pressures facing education and the overwhelming response to the consultation. However, and I must emphasize, there remains a significant pressure on the education budget. Throughout the budget process, my aim was to protect as far as possible the funding to frontline services. Therefore, following this final budget allocation and my wider education budget review, I immediately allocated £80 million to the aggregated schools budget. This allocation means that there has been no reduction in cash terms to school delegated budgets, although in real terms schools will face pay and inflationary pressures in 15-16. My focus remains on raising standards and closing the achievement gap. This continuous improvement will best be achieved when schools are supported and trusted to develop their own school improvement strategies. Also, by working with the board, CCMS and others, my objective through the area planning process is to develop a network of sustainable and financially viable schools, right size and in the right place, and able to maximise the use of available resources so they can focus on providing the quality of education their pupils deserve. Well, Mr Dunn for supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. Can the Minister give us an assurance that the Board of Governors of schools like Hollywood Primary that meets later this week, that following the budget allocation you have just mentioned, that there will be no reductions as such and it will be business as usual for our schools? Well, I am very reluctant to comment in regards to any individual school, but it has to be recognised that despite the very much welcome contribution to the education budget as part of the final uh, budget of £64 odd million pounds and my allocation of £80 million pounds to aggregate the schools budget, there remains pressures. There remains wage pressures and there, rem there remains inflationary pressures upon schools. And schools will make decisions as to how to manage those pressures themselves are best, and are also best placed to make the decisions as to how to manage those pressures as well. I am continuing to analyse the remainder of my budget and budget lines, and I am attempting to ensure that I uh, provide more funding to frontline education services, and I will make announcements in that regard in the weeks ahead. Call Mr. Fra McCann. Question 5. Um, as Minister of Education, one of my key priorities has been ensuring that our children and young people have the knowledge, skills and attitudes to succeed and do well in work and in life. I am confident that the curriculum allows schools the flexibility necessary for students to build the skills, attitudes and understanding they need to be global citizens, connected and able to contribute to the global economy. The curriculum ensures that all our students are educated in the changing concept of a career and various types of jobs in the local area as well as opportunities to explore enterprise and entrepreneurship. These opportunities allow for our young people to investigate the need for creativity and enterprise, whether as an employer or employee, and to identify and practice some of the skills and develop the attributes associated with being uh, enterprising. The flexibility offered by the curriculum framework and the curriculum means that schools can respond fully to meet the needs of the economy and by taking account of up-to-date labour market information skills shortages and priority skills area as they emerge in widening and reviewing their curricular offer to pupils. Mr. Fran McCann for supplementary. I would like to thank the Minister uh, for his response so far. But can the Minister say if ICT subjects such as computer coding can be streamlined in schools going forward? Well, computer coding is already available to our schools and many primary schools in particular are taking the advantage of bringing in outside clubs and their own skills and resources to provide computer coding. In regards to uh, GCSEs, etc., uh, members will be aware that I, I commissioned a fundamental review of GCSEs and A levels in 2012, and that work is now in train. And consequences, new and more challenging A levels and GCSEs will be put in place, including a GCSE in relation to uh, computer science. Call Michelle McElveen. 
Speaker, and, and the member has referred to, to coding in primary schools, but the, the Minister will be aware of the lobby being made by digital industries um, around the introduction of coding from the age of eight um, into the curriculum. Is the Minister giving that consideration? Um, our curriculum is broad-based, and there are demands on occasions for a variety of subjects or materials to be uh, to be defined within the curriculum and to ensure that at a certain time at a certain time allocation is given to the teaching of these various subjects. I am reluctant to go down that road at this stage. I believe the curriculum serves its purpose. I believe that the curriculum allows for flexibility uh, in the system. Though I am also conscious that by 2016 the, the curriculum will be approximately 10 years old and at that stage will be subject for a review. And I think at that stage it would be useful for whomever the minister is at that stage to conduct a review of the curriculum and make decisions around as to whether aspects of learning should become compulsory, in, including computer coding. Call Leslie Cree. Thank you. I'd like to ask the minister um, what action he is taking to concentrate on non-academic skills, you know, such as confidence, uh, resilience, um, trustworthiness, and other essential life skills. Well, uh, that question relates to the very first question that was asked during question time, um, that education is much broader based on simple analysis of the behaviour and performance of 10 and 11-year-old children. Uh, our curriculum allows and is, is built around learning and skills-based uh, education. It ensures a very wide spread of topics uh, and subjects can be availed of. And indeed, when, when young people are progressing to, through their learning in post-primary school at GCSE, they now have to have a, have a choice of up to 24 subjects and when moving towards A level, a minimum of 27 subjects at that stage. So there is a strong basis upon academia, vocational and general, built into our curriculum. And I think, when I, well, I know when I'm engaging with employers uh, and some significant employers, they're asking, yes, for well-qualified young people in terms of academia, but they're asking also that our young people are well-rounded that they're young, confident citizens, and that they're able to t uh, be team players and team builders when they go into the workplace. So I believe our curriculum allows for that, and I think our schools uh, can and should be encouraged to continue down that pathway without distractions. I call Maeve McLaughlin. Uh, there is currently a review of GCSE provision being undertaken here and in England and Wales. Since we have in the main an open market for qualifications, this will remain that the revised specifications will, become, will be coming available to schools over the next three years. Responsibility for introducing new subjects at GCSE rests with an individual awarding organisation. Decisions by awarding organisations, including SEA, on the nature and scope of the GCSE offer will reflect demand from schools. For example, in response to the requirement of the entitlement framework, SEA has in recent years introduced new GCSE titles, including contemporary crafts and agriculture and land use. In addition, in responding to discussions with key stakeholders, including employers, SEA has uh, as part of its GCSE provisions, planned to provide a GCSE in software development for first teaching from September 2017. Sorry, 2017. In considering the development of new titles, all awarding organisations will need to take account of the accreditation criteria requirement for GCSE qualifications set by the regulator here. I call Ms McLaughlin for a supplement. I thank the Minister for his, his answer thus far. Um, can I ask the Minister specifically, given that some schools uh, would like to opt for subjects such as politics at an earlier stage, uh, is there room um, to do that or what options will be available? There are opportunities, uh, particularly through uh, learning for life and work. Uh, this qualification provides an introduction to government and politics and reflects the curriculum requirements for local and global citizenship within our curriculum at key stages three and four. From foundation to key stage two, all pupils study personal development and mutual understanding, which encompasses two strands, one of which is mutual understanding in the local and wider community, which can have a broad interpretation uh, for, for teachers in the classroom. And, and they can use, as I said in responses to earlier questions, they can use whatever material and tools they can. And I welcome the fact that uh, often on a Monday and Tuesday, you will see primary school children in and around our assembly uh, involved and in, in, in learning about how this assembly works and engaging at a very, very 
early age. I, I don't know whether they're impressed or not, but I do know they'd be here. Order. That ends the period for written questions, listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions. I call Mr William Humphrey. The Minister for his answers so far. The Minister has been very supportive of the Children and Young People Zone for the Greater Shankill. The Minister will also probably be aware of the sad decision that Belfast Education Library Board took, to say, took recently to close Malvern Primary School in West Belfast. Can I ask the Minister, when it comes to his table, what his view will be on that decision of closure? My view on that uh, development proposal will be based on the submissions I received during the consultation period whether that be from elected representatives or from the school pupils or the broader community. I have no view established yet in regards to the matter and will only make a decision when all the facts are before me. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. On Friday, the Member of Parliament for North Belfast, Nigel Dodds, and I met with the Principal of Glenwood Primary School. Uh, this school is due a new school and will be an educational hub for the Mid-Shankill. Can I ask the Minister when the work will begin on that particular development and project? Uh, two questions for the price of one. Uh, uh, apologies to the member. I wouldn't have that information in front of me, but I'm more than happy to supply him with the information in due course. Call Mr Tom Buchanan. Honourable Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister what action he has taken to free up the pathway for teachers from within the unionist community uh, to access employment in a school within the maintained sector? Um, I assume the member's question refers to, and has been raised during question time, in regard to the Celtic certificate for teaching purposes. The member may be aware that the certificate is available to uh, non-Catholic members of the community through uh, distance learning courses, I think at the University of Glasgow, and perhaps also through Stranmillis uh, as well. So there is a number of opportunities for uh, non-Catholic teachers to achieve that certificate and teach within the maintained sector. And for supplementary. Thank you. Does the Minister though not accept that this is a barrier and that this barrier is discrimination against those teachers from within the unionist community? I accept it's certainly a perceived barrier uh, and I, my personal view is that it should be done away with, that in terms of teaching of the sacraments, that uh, I believe that there are other ways of achieving that uh, objective and goal for, for the Catholic sector rather than having every teacher with a certificate. Uh, but the member will also be aware that any change to equality legislation is the responsibility of OFM to EFM. I call Mr Roy Beggs. Would the Minister give an update on the capital and resource funding that will be available to schools in the foreseeable future and how he is facilitating agreed amalgamations which can improve educational outcomes and have re reduced uh, running costs, such as a new skilled project for Alan McGee? Um, the education budget has was being discussed as I entered the chamber just before question time. And as I've said, while I welcome the fact that we've received £64 million as a result of the final budget, there are still significant revenue pressures in regards to education. And I'll be making further decisions in due course as to how we deal with those revenue pressures and if and where we can inject more revenue into frontline services. In relation to capital, there's a significant uh, dip in the capital budget for education moving forward. I believe that all those minor pro or major projects that I've announced will continue to move forward. Uh, however, there may be some delay in some of the uh, school enhancement programmes and there will be less money for minor works programmes as well moving forward. In regards to the Pacific School, the member mentions I have no details in front of me in regards to that matter and I'm more than happy to share uh, any information we have in regards to that or an update uh, with the member in due course. Mr Beggs, your supplementary. Would the minister acknowledge that the pupils, parents and indeed the community in Island McGill feel that they are being discriminated against when they agreed the amalgamation of Bally Primore, Kilcoan and Mullock Do primary schools over 10 years ago, but as of yet no school has been built. Yet the Minister has been able to find perhaps over £2 million for his own pet project school, an Irish language school, and that they feel, uh, which, which also will be operating at a, a projected running cost, and that local children in my community feel that they are being discriminated against and when the Minister ensure that he deals with all members Order. of the community equally. Order. Um, 
one of the downsides of topical questions is that a member can stand up and ask a constituency specific uh, question about, his, and I, as Minister, am supposed to have details on the 18 constituencies and all the other projects that are in front of them. It's simply impossible for me to have. It's simply impossible. Uh, I am only in post four years. So, therefore, whatever happened before I came into post, I know nothing about. I have made a number of announcements about uh, capital projects moving forward. A number of them require development proposals, uh, and I think there may have been changes uh, around development proposals in that area of which you refer to, sponsored by the board, and then there was a change of heart, and that caused delay uh, as well. So, when I make an announcement about a new capital build, uh, I make it on the basis of consultation with the sponsoring managing body, whether it be CCMS or the Education Board. If there is a change after that, then that is inevitably going to cause delay. But while I can assure you there is no element of discrimination in regards to these matters, uh, I have not directed any capital funding uh, towards College to Europe, and I will ensure that I continue to lobby for, and drive, lobby for more money for capital and drive forward the capital building programme. And I, I noted as I came into the chamber that the chair of the Education Committee was able to report that the Department of Education has spent all its capital funds uh, over this last number of years, and I intend to make that the case this year as well. Call Mr. David Hildy. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the minister give us any details of the extent of misuse and the problems surrounding social media within schools? Uh, clearly, social media. Uh, Social media has a positive element, without doubt, uh, and, and, are, and it is being used by both pupils and, and teachers and schools in a positive element and a learning uh, criterion within our schools. But, however, it is also being used in bullying uh, and the viewing and spreading of inappropriate information, whether it be about individuals or made up information about individuals, referred to as cyber bullying. I am currently out to consultation on anti bullying strategy. As part of that, we are looking at cyberbullying. I am also involved in collaboration with the Department of Health, who is taking a lead on a broader element in relation to cyberbullying. Well, Mr. Hildes for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. There are indeed a number of uh, pilot schemes and programmes about at the moment, and certainly I know Mr. Simpson down in your own constituency has been involved in one. Uh, could you give us a, a, have you had a chance to study of any of those, or could they be used across the educational sector? I was actually recently uh, in, in a primary school in Pomeroy, in County Tyrone, and they have, uh, along with an outside arts company, produced a very, very informative film, which was put together by the young people of the school, uh, involved the young people of the school, and they set out their relationship and reaction to uh, social media. And I thought it was very, very informative. And very, very succinct in the messages it was sending out. And the simple message was, if you wouldn't trust a stranger on the street, why would you trust a stranger online? Uh, and I think the young people put the message across very, very well. So I am familiar with the projects being run by individual schools and communities in relation to uh, cyberbullying and, and other such matters. Call Mr Paul Frey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, and given the restoration, Minister, of some £2 million uh, from in the budget to the to the library boards uh, around the youth centres, can he give this House an assurance that uh, youth centres will be sufficiently supported uh, in budgetary terms in the coming year? Um, well, I have restored approximately £2 million to ELB youth. It will be a matter for the education and library boards as to how that money is distributed uh, across the youth sector. Call Mr Freer for supplement. <laughs> Given the fact that these youth centres do a tremendous body of work uh, with young people uh, acting as a diversion away from uh, people maybe getting involved in crime and also teaching them other things socially uh, outside of school setting, uh, would the Minister be supportive of uh, enhanced funding for these youth centres? Well, it's, it's the diver uh, different challenges and demands within education, and it's worth reminding the member that. This party brought forward a motion to this House only a few weeks ago, calling on for me to protect frontline education, as in schools only. When I raised the point that what about, what about uh, and there was an amendment I think, from my party colleagues about youth work uh, and other factors, that amendment was rejected by the House. You can't have it both ways. You can't call for funding one day and then reject a, a proposal on it uh, on another day. I am fully supportive of youth work. 
I believe that it is an integral part of our education system. Over my period in office, I have increased funding to it. I was keen to announce the funding to the ELB youth sector uh, at the same time as I announced funding for our schools, and I will do my best to enhance uh, youth funding in the time ahead when, in what is a very, very difficult education budget climate. Mr Ross Hussey is not in his place. I call Mr Sammy Wilson. And I thought the principal deputy speaker was a good friend of mine. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask uh, the Minister, I know that last year that um, he ordered a stay of execution to Dundonald High School. Would he agree with me that that school is making very good progress at this point in time? Well, I, I would go further. There's, there's to be no changes to Dundonald High School. The decision has been made. It's, it's staying open. It's an integral part of the education framework in that area. And I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, the pupils, the parents, the community, and the teaching staff and senior management staff uh, within that school for the excellent work they have been doing since um, a decision was made about the future of the school. Well, Mr. Douglas, for supplementary. I thank you, Minister, for his answer so far. And, and I don't think I included politicians. I thank all the MLS uh, uh, that lobbied him. Um, but could I ask the Minister would, uh, would he continue to encourage his officials and others to work with the school and the parents to ensure the success for? a major school in East Belfast. I have no difficulty congratulating the local MLAs on that matter. Despite the hard time you continually give me, uh, you and your colleagues, I have to say, worked well with myself and my department, and it was clear working well with the community and school in that area to ensure that there was sustainable education provision moving forward. Mr Edwin Poots. Uh, to declare an interest as a school governor, when will the minister be actually informing um, boards of governors as to the readjusted budget, uh, given the additional finance they received in the last budget? We are finalising preparations for letters to issue to all schools, uh, hopefully by the end of this month. The, the member will appreciate that it is quite a complicated formula we have to run, taking into account any changes to the school in terms of its pupil intake, etc. And then we will notify schools of exactly what their budget will be for the coming uh, financial year. The approach for supplementary. Mr. Minister recognises the stresses that school governors and uh, school management teams have been under, and uh, consequently, given the, the significant rise that he received from the, uh, the executive's approval of the Department of Finance's proposal, um, that he will be adjusting the school budgets significantly upwards from the original proposal. Well, the members are aware that I have announced uh, £80 million pounds for the aggregated schools budget, the, the global amount, which is a, around a 0.2 per cent increase in funding uh, for the next financial year. However, the, each individual schools budget is a much more complicated formula, which has to be run for 1,138 schools, and they will be all informed in due course. But I do remind the member and I remind the House that there is still a very difficult financial uh, picture in the year ahead for education. There are difficult decisions yet to be made uh, going forward, and it will prove to be a very, very difficult year uh, for schools and boards, uh, well, the Education Authority and any other uh, body at uh, attached to education. I welcome very, very much the decision by the executive to increase funding uh, to education, but all departments are dealing in what is a unique and difficult financial environment. Call Mr. Stephen Moutry. Deputy Speaker, can the Minister outline the number and progress of development proposals submitted by schools to his department in the Craig Avon area? <laughs> um, I think we have four currently uh, in, the, in the Craig Avon area. Uh, we have one for St Mary's in uh, Derry Moor, Akagan. We have one for uh, one in. Now you've caught me. Just give me one second. I think we have an answer to our question here, something similar to that. Yes, uh, there are currently two development proposals for schools in the Upper Bond area. Uh, one for St Mary's Primary School in Derry Moor, uh, and another for St Patrick's Primary School in Maherlin. Thank you. And I thank the Minister for his answer, but can I ask the Minister, what does he intend to do for the pupils of Lurgan College, Portadown College, and the Lurgan campus of the senior high school, who for years have been an outdated accommodation which is not fit for purpose? There is a difference between a development proposal in regards to school enrolment or change of character of a school 
than the, on the second question the members asked me. That's in relation to capital investment. Uh, though I do think that both of them are connected here. There needs to be a change of direction of education in that area, which takes into account the needs of all the young people in the area, uh, and not just two of the schools in the area. And I think if we get into a mindset where we're dealing with all the young people uh, in the post-primary sector, in the controlled sector uh, in Craigavon, then I think we can come forward with uh, a proposal which will receive financial support and support from the Department of Education. But at the minute, many, many people are focused on two schools and not them all. Let's now move on 